everybody, and welcome to Dated by number 133, featuring Fellows Talks by Michelle Gilman, Anita Say Chan, and Dan Volk. My name is Sarita Amrute, Director of Research here at Data and Society. I will be your host for tonight, supported by my team behind the curtain, CJ, Rigo, Natalie, and Angie. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research organization studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can learn more about us through our website, datasociety.net. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community and the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, not just the Lenape community on whose lands data and society is located in what we now refer to as New York City. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in this history? I also ask you today to join me in recognizing the activists protesting in the streets, in city council meetings, in their workplaces, and around the kitchen table to support black liberation and end racism in all its forms. I'd now like to turn it over to our featured presenters, the 2019-2020 fellows, Michelle Gilman, Anita Say Chan, and Dan Bo. Faculty fellows help ensure that new connections and perspectives deepen and expand our community's understanding of the challenges and opportunities society faces in a data-centric world. I'm especially looking forward to learning from each lightning talk as the fellows contextualize their work in relation to historic and current racial justice movements. We'll then have time for a Q&A. First up, Michelle Gilman with her talk, The Class Differential in Data Privacy. Take it away, Michelle. Thanks, Sarita. Hi, I'm Michelle Gilman. I'm a law professor who directs a law clinic in Baltimore, Maryland. That means I teach and supervise law students who provide pro bono or free legal representation to people who cannot afford an attorney. When I started practicing poverty law over 20 years ago, it was immediately clear that my clients had far less privacy than my suburban upper middle class neighbors. My clients not only lived in densely packed neighborhoods under the constant eye of the police, but they had to turn over extremely personal and sensitive information in order to access government assistance. Over the last two decades, I've observed how emerging technologies have been deployed against low-income people in ways that add scope, scale, and speed to the privacy deprivations they have long suffered. These deprivations are affronts to dignity and liberty and also barriers to economic equality and racial justice. These dynamics are heightened in the current moment. I'm going to focus tonight on the pandemic and the police response to the Black Lives Matter protests. But I'm not talking about issues that you've seen on CNN, Instagram, or Twitter. I'm talking instead about processes that are largely invisible to the general public, but that have real world impacts. My prediction is that the pandemic and the protests will result in digital profiling that will in turn harm marginalized communities and extend the long tail of these crises. First, let's consider the pandemic. We are in the grip of a dire public health and economic crisis being suffered most acutely by black, brown, and indigenous people of color. Even when the public health emergency recedes, these groups will struggle to regain their financial footing, in part as a result of digital profiling. So what do I mean by digital profiling? There are vast networks of data extraction that gather our personal data every time we turn on our computer, pick up a smartphone, or engage with a government agency. These interactions generate millions of data points used to profile us. This is not unique to marginalized people. 
but the outcomes of this data scraping are different for the poor. This is because digital profiling is used not only to target people with ads, but also to screen people by landlords, employers, lenders, and universities. This is problematic in the best of economic times, but it is particularly fraught now. As of today, over 41 million people have lost their jobs. In most jurisdictions, there are temporary moratoriums on evictions. However, these moratoriums will expire soon and the accumulated rent bills will become due. Prior to the pandemic, one in four renters were already spending more than half their income on rent. The housing unaffordability crisis will deepen as people remain out of work and unemployment insurance benefits time out. Thus, housing experts predict an avalanche of evictions if the government does not cancel rent or provide tenants with rental assistance. Having an eviction on your record can make it hard to find future housing. That's the digital profiling dilemma. In selecting tenants, most landlords will search court records or purchase a tenant screening report from a data mining company. Landlords disfavor applicants with prior eviction cases on their records, even though these records are often inaccurate, confuse tenants with similar names, and can fail to show the outcome of a case, meaning that even if a tenant ultimately won the case, they have a permanent negative mark on their record. Consider also that people who catch coronavirus may be facing large medical bills. The estimated cost of COVID-19 care for patients who are hospitalized ranges between 20 and $70,000. Even before the pandemic, medical debt was the primary driver for two thirds of personal bankruptcies. In addition, across the country, people are accruing debt in a scramble to pay for food, to cover utility bills, and to maintain internet access for schools and work. The medical and other debts from coronavirus will feed into the big data system. In turn, these debts will lower people's credit scores and appear in other digital screening profiles. As a result, millions of people will be denied loans or have to pay higher interest rates for them. They may struggle to meet basic needs. They may even find it difficult to find employment because most employers use digital background checks in order to select employees. Now, Let's turn to the protests. Here my concern is that the police response to the protests will serve as a digital barrier to future opportunities for many protesters. Since the protests began, more than 10,000 people have been arrested. Whether or not these protesters end up with a conviction, and even if they are acquitted, these arrests will appear in their court records and be scraped into their digital profiles. Police departments also release mugshots onto the internet, making them easy to find with a quick Google search. The collateral consequences of having an easily searchable criminal record are serious. A criminal record operates as a barrier for people to get loans, find jobs, enroll in higher education, qualify for public benefits, and obtain professional licenses. In some cases, protesters will be able to take advantage of state laws to expunge their criminal records, meaning taking legal steps to delete them from state databases. But this process can be hard to navigate. And once these public records have been scraped, the data has already been captured and is almost impossible to remove from the hundreds of profiling companies that profit from selling the data. Even people not arrested on the scene might face criminal charges in the future due to extensive surveillance of the protests. 
Law enforcement has been monitoring protesters' text messages and locations. Other surveillance tools include license plate readers, social media monitoring, police body cameras, drones, and facial recognition technology. This is nothing less than the criminalization of constitutionally protected conduct, the right of free expression. I should note here that data itself is not the problem. The problem is when data is deployed to oppress and stigmatize people. In the right hands, access to data can also serve justice. As we saw last week with the repeal in New York State of 50A, a statute which long protected police disciplinary records from public view. This recent law reform is a reminder that controlling data is about power. Clearly, the pandemic and the protests are amplifying long-standing dynamics in which low-income people and people of color face greater harms from state surveillance and data extraction technologies. What does law have to say about this? The short answer is that privacy law is generally more concerned about protecting the interests of the powerful than the poor. I will highlight briefly three limitations in American privacy law. First, in the United States, we do not have a comprehensive data privacy statute to protect our personal data. Rather, our legal regime hinges primarily on the concept of notice and consent. This puts the onus on you to protect your personal data. Yet my guess is that you don't read the convoluted take it or leave it terms offered as a condition for accessing websites and apps. Of course not, you can't negotiate the terms even if you want to. This individualistic notion of privacy gives companies and governments free reign to use your data as they see fit. It ignores the ways that data is used to collectively sort, score, and segment groups of people. It also puts an undue burden on already strained communities. Not surprisingly, a data and society survey found that low-income people have less confidence and greater concerns about their ability to protect their digital privacy and security. Second, Courts protect privacy interests that are deemed reasonable. However, the measure of reasonableness is drawn from a white, middle class, and male norm. Interests outside that norm are not reasonable and thus not protected. That's why the government can legally search the homes of welfare recipients, but has never sought to conduct home visits for people claiming a mortgage tax deduction which is just another form of a government benefit. The reasonableness standard also underlies the premise that information shared publicly or with third parties is not protected from government surveillance. Modern technology is straining this doctrine and we can expect to see many legal challenges to the surveillance of the protests in the months to come. Third, Discrimination law can play a role in limiting some of the disparate aspects of technology. However, as scholars have explained, civil rights laws written for an analog world are a tough fit for the digital world, where computer algorithms now perform tasks that were previously performed by people. Discrimination law is also a limited remedy because poor people are not a protected class. They can be discriminated against with impunity. Finally, discrimination law is about generating an equal playing field, but it does nothing to give people the equipment, uniforms, or cleats needed to play the game. That requires an equity approach grounded in social and economic rights. In conclusion, the protests have highlighted so many needed actions throughout our society to achieve racial justice. To this list, we can add two more. Abolish the data extraction economy and abolish state surveillance. Thank you.
So I am going to introduce Anita Se-Chan. Anita will be speaking to us about feminist data futures and relational infrastructures. Please take it away, Anita. Thanks, Sarita. Um, let me introduce myself. I am a information um, science professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, and I'll be speaking tonight to you about the relational infrastructures of protest, uh, since, of course, uh, protest has been a lot on a lot of our not minds. And perhaps unlike any other time since the 1960s in the US, protest has been propelled into the national consciousness. In mainstream liberal news sources in particular, we're likely to have heard about it framed as an outcry of shared grief, frustration, or defiance. But in my comments today, I want to suggest that protest serves another key function that's largely been overlooked, and that is for it to serve as a key means for populations, namely vulnerable populations, to publicly assess and speak back to knowledge practice. Protest, in other words, is not just a means to mobilize around a shared sentiment, I want to suggest it's also a means for marginalized populations to use the resource of public space to call for new forms of knowledge work, and to do this in three ways. Firstly, by explicitly exposing the insufficiency of how dominant forms of common knowledge come to be not just defined, but stabilized in mainstream institutions and infrastructures. Secondly, by producing evidence on the narrowness of what it is that's presumed to be given knowns when it comes to vulnerable populations. And thirdly, by suggesting new infrastructures that can test and prototype empirical conditions for building other possible worlds. Protests may be read, in other words, as mobilizations around what feminist science studies scholar Donna Haraway called situated knowledges that insist upon the need for other perspectives to offer better accounts of the world in order to, quote, live in critical relationship to practices of domination, end quote. That's arguably something that projects like Data for Black Lives, founded by Yashim Bate Milner, underscore, and it's something too that's echoed by the neo menace movement that's mobilized since 2015 to combat gender-based violence in Latin America. That's been my research focus. Their efforts have, been call have called attention to feminicide as hate crimes against women and the striking absence of data around it as a matter of shared regional concern. Two years before the US Me Too movement exploded, this is what the streets of Buenos Aires looked like. And this was too. Since 2015, New and Amenos, not one less in English, has drawn together some of the largest demonstrations in the region. In Argentina, these began with a march after the murder of 14-year-old Chiara Paez, who was found buried under her boyfriend's home, beaten to death, and just a few weeks pregnant. Parallel protests were launched all across the region. In Peru, more than 50,000 field highways in Lima. In Chile, more than 80,000 joined, and marches since 2016 have not only shut down streets in Santiago, but also closed university campuses, with more than 25 closing in 2018, including high schools, where protesters called not only for accountability around harassment cases, but also decried the exclusion of women in leadership, faculty, and in assigned syllabi. And most recently, mobilizations in Mexico this spring captured widespread attention when more than 100,000 marched to the Palacio Nacional, where parallel protests were held in cities from Merida to Tijuana. But while protesters, or while, that is, while national media tended to emphasize uh, the, uh, the unique and local cases as catalysts for uh, the protest, protesters and organizers themselves pointed instead to global feminist researchers who've been pointing to data as a critical resource for their own efforts. NGOs like Feminicide Watch, for instance, estimate the number of women intentionally killed in feminicide cases, 87,000 in 2017, was near equal to the victims killed in armed conflicts worldwide, 89,000 that year, with the key difference here being that the vast majority of feminicide cases are killed by people that they know. The understore still the widespread inaction of states with few collecting any data on feminicide and even fewer compiling official countrywide data. This entrenched invisibilization of feminicide brings to mind US feminist data science scholars who critique the long silence of bodies missing from the archives states and corporations do deem worthy of producing. Organizers have pushed back though and are not only naming state inaction as complicity in what they call the uncounted epidemic of feminicide, but have begun to build their own infrastructures to register data. In Argentina, citizens launched the first national index on gender violence designing a 186 question survey for women and transgender women nationwide. Crowdsourcing projects have also begun by researchers elsewhere like Anita Lucchesi who launched an archive for murdered and missing indigenous women in Canada and the US. The Women Count Project 
was also started by Don Wilcox to draw together data in the US with a network of volunteers researching cases state by state. But the Argentinian efforts in particular have been uniquely recognized for creating some of the largest global data sets on feminicide. Run entirely by volunteers, the network's first survey received over 60,000 responses with results showing over 97% of respondees had suffered some kind of gender violence. And despite being approached by institutions like the state to partner for future research, the network remains independent. As they've put it, violence against women is indeed domestic violence, but it is also in the violence of the state, market and capitalist property relations. It's in the violence that results from discriminatory policies against LGBTQ people for mass incarceration, criminalizing migratory movements and from abortion bans. Data work for them thus strives to empower grassroots infrastructures and local accountability. And among the new infrastructures collectives have grown include those fostered in Veracruz, Mexico, where new hotlines for domestic violence and finding refuge and uh, for finding refuge, networks to provide accessible legal aid, and a system of food donations for families hard hit by quarantine have emerged. Existing infrastructures like the streets of Mexico City have also been repurposed and covered with victim, victims' names to publicly evidence their loss. An online letter to the president and a campaign, Nosotros tenemos otros datos, we have other data was also launched to highlight records like the number of domestic violence calls during quarantine at 155 calls per hour, all to respond to the president's dismissal of such reports as disinformation. Of course, science and technology scholars amongst us will be aware of the way our attentions have been turned to the hidden power of infrastructures to stabilize dominant framings of reality. The so-called epistemic infrastructures that Michelle Murphy writes of, for instance, the buildings, bureaucracies, and technologies that created dense numbers and data about previously unrelated objects like population and the economy came to turn life into something newly calculable. And they transformed them what were once experimental research methods to quantify life into pervasive 20th century givens. Here though, we consider not just the epistemic infrastructures that stabilize dominant givens, but the overlooked work of what I'd call the relational infrastructures of data justice networks to remake shared imaginaries and spaces of public life. These embodied forms generate other means and materialities for intersectional knowing and connective accountability to remake worlds in need of transformation and redress. But I'd be remiss to suggest that, trans that relational infrastructures are new and I wanna close by quickly gesturing to the longer history of feminist data and the work of sites like the Hull House Project founded in 1889 in Chicago's multi-ethnic 19th Ward by Jane Addams and her partner, Ellen Gate Starr. Many might remember its leading role in the US settlement house movement and its unique success in advancing such key legal reforms in the US as the eight hour workday, minimum wage and outlawing child labor. But it was also known for prototyping various approaches to social science and community research that championed what amounted to a new ethical paradigm for understanding poverty, one that emphasized collective responsibility, change, and social justice over dominant ideas of the day that saw poverty as the result of individual failing or even biology. Part of this involved Hull House's infrastructural design that blended a community center with an educational campus in Chicago's West Side, where local families, large immigrants, and ethnic minorities could access classrooms and libraries for free courses, kindergarten and daycare, theater and art studios, gyms and athletic programs, and coffee houses and meeting rooms. Such spaces were also used to foster though novel approaches to research by residents and to document data on local labor conditions. Hull House Maps and Papers published in 1895 was an exemplar and quickly placed it at the forefront of new social science techniques that later established fields from urban sociology to social work. Chapters on the sweatshot system and child labor written by 10 authors, eight of which were women and three who identified as US immigrants, thus featured the use of surveys and statistical data alongside direct testimony from 19th Ward residents to newly capture how gender, ethnicity and age impacted the lives of working residents. Color-coded wage maps were also paired with essays and showed how statistical and visual techniques could be blended in compelling ways with qualitative narrative and be used in this case to evidence the scale of wage exploitation in the 19th Ward, where monthly wages adjusted to today's values will be just $500 to $2,000 a month for the wages of an entire household that then often included working children. Halas is a relevant, relevant reminder then of the longer legacy of research infrastructures that use data as the basis for local organizing and that engaged amateurs as well as professional social scientists. While struggles over the terms of research on poverty, however, will begin to shift towards a more detached technical paradigm decades later, 
those credited with founding US sociology decades later at the University of Chicago would draw amply from the techniques innovated by Hull House and social reformers, but would train their students to detach themselves from local communities. By the late 1920s, this shift reinforced two growing gender divides where Hull House researchers would be framed as social workers rather than social scientists, and where research professions increasingly excluded groups most vulnerable to poverty themselves, that is minorities, women, and the working classes. And while most Hull House alum never became household names, it was still obviously generative, with many going on to serve key leading roles in history-making organizations from the NAACP to Legal Aid, the National Consumers League, and the Progressive Party. To close then, we might say that in contrast to the empirical infrastructures around objective social science that came to take hold, that the relational infrastructures of Hull House and data justice protesters today aim for new means to foster engaged research and would strive for these methods as key to transforming material worlds and future knowledge practice alike. Thanks. Now, uh, let me close and pass on uh, the mic to my colleague, Dan Boak. Thank you all for coming out. I, uh, I want to thank also CJ, Rigo, Natalie, and Angie, and everyone else teams making this all possible for us. Today, I'd like to talk about reading data, reading data closely, reading data deeply. My text is the 1940 US Census. Early 20th century censuses were old school big data. In 1940, we see billions of pieces of personal data about 130 million Americans from all walks of life. It's also a remarkably open and transparent kind of data. After 72 years, all responses by individuals are made to be non-confidential. And so as a result, we see uh, everything that people enter as data and we also get to see exactly the methods by which they were produced. So we often think of data making as a linear process, like an assembly line. And that's where I'd like to begin with a process by which a person became census data in 1940. We'll begin with the form. My colleague, Caitlin Rosenthal, the author of Accounting for Slavery, has a great maxim that she uses to talk about this. She talks about reading the frame, not the data. We read the frame and not the data. Here, we're looking around here. We're not looking in here. We look at the categories, the columns, the labels, and that gives a sense of the values and ideas of those who designed that form, the set of the society that produced it. If we read the frame here, we find that race is fundamental and closely prescribed. These are the official racial categories for 1940. They're determined in Washington, DC. We see them listed here, white, Negro, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Hindu, Korean, a possibility for other. These categories have long histories uh, they vary by time and place. I would point to the work of Melissa Nobles, the books by Melissa Nobles and Deborah Thompson, for examples of uh, how it is that those vary across time and how they move through nations. Next, after the form, we get the data. Forms go out, they're carried by enumerators like this one, off to be for the questioning of the nation where all the answers are written down. This is a photo from a test census in 1939 in Indiana. It highlights the centrality of whiteness for the census, uh, both first in selecting a predominantly white county, two predominantly white counties for the test. And then if we look at this publicity shot, it is all white folks and the only white people in any of these publicity shots. Here on the right, we see two more from the trial census. Over here, this is a stage photograph of someone uh, enumerating the heartthrob Tyrone power. The encounter of the enumerator and person is filled with mystery. People assert their identities, enumerators ascribe identities onto people. It's hard to know whose idea, whose assertions went out. All we know is that the enumerator writes something down. Langston Hughes dramatized that mystery in uh, looking at the struggle of a black woman to be seen as she chose in a poem called Madam and the Census Ma'am, a poem that I wish I could rehearse for you right now, but I don't have time, but I encourage you to look at that. Uh, here is how Hughes and his household were recorded in the census in 1940, in this case taken down on April 17th by an African-American enumerator in Harlem named Thomas W. Mosley. Step three 
The completed census is shipped to Washington, D.C. to be processed. All of those forms are put in leather binders, shipped off. And the first step is editing. Here we see what is labeled here as the Negro section, a segregated statistical workforce within a segregated federal government within a segregated city in Washington, D.C. For more on the way that uh, surveillance was racialized in 1940 and the 1940 census, I point you to the work of J.D. Schnepf. It might have been one of these editors, one of these workers, who edited the 
I'm going to take a few moments to ask a few questions and then draw some questions from the Q&A. So those of you in the audience who have questions, please do populate the Q&A. What I was thinking about as I was listening is that all of your work in some way tackles the topic of race, data, and oppression, but from very different vantage points. And I would love to hear from you how the current movement for Black liberation, the movement for Black lives, has affected the way you approach your work. What parts of your findings do you specifically want to highlight in light of the movement for Black lives and the call to defund police departments? All right, I'll jump in. Um, well, for me, the current movement is really an inspirational model for effectuating social change. And so I'm very interested in learning from this movement, listening to this movement, and to work with grassroots activists to advocate for changes that would advance justice for Black communities in Baltimore, along with my students as well. Um, in terms of my work, one thing I'm hoping to highlight is how you can't cabin off the criminal justice system as something separate. It's deeply intertwined with people's ability to interact with all aspects of society. Um, entanglements with the criminal justice system impact where people can live, uh, what, where they can work, whether they can vote, and, and just so much more. So once we defund the police, uh, we need to make sure that digital markers of difference don't limit people's ability to flourish and live up to their potential. Yeah, and just to build on some of Michelle's comments. Um, so thank you, Sarita, for that, uh, for that question and for that really sort of timely and gorgeous question. Um, so uh, that this is not just the protests are sort of, you know, a moment, but um, they're also uh, a diagnostic. Um, on the kinds of problems, the larger problems within the system. Um, this is about system reform, um, and we can think about um, the police and criminal justice system as one system, um, but what I think has been so illuminating and really inspiring for many of us is also the kind of diagnostic of the degree to which many, many systems, not just limited to police and criminal justice, but many systems have been in long and deep need of reform, and that we've now been all being brought to the kind of moment of reckoning with the evidence of just how much work we allowed to not get done sort of collectively, and now how much work is before us to be challenged, to dare to imagine our institutions differently um, from criminal justice to academia, to research institutions, to, I mean, you know, name it, different kinds of workplaces to hopefully the tech industry as well, um, but really being challenged by protesters to really get to imagine and to know our futures slightly differently. Um, this moment, I think, is also one, um, I mean, to, to as a nod to the kind of breadth of the fellows research um, and my colleagues, Michelle and Dan as well, um, this year to the kind of work of how, of why research is so instructive and also why history is so instructive. Um, and this moment I think has brought many of us to start looking through past archives. Um, and for me to look at past archives of the intersection between protest and research, um, again, not just a think about protesters as sort of just protesters, right? Sort of rabble rousers on the street or these mobilizers on the street, but really to take seriously the deep layers of research and knowledge work that go into protest practices um, and the layers of kind of protest infrastructures. That's not just work on the street, but also work behind the scenes. Um, so Sarita, you know, you and I have been having these conversations as well about the sort of founding of the NAACP um, and looking through some of these old documents that heavily evidence, um, not just the kind of allyships that were built across different kinds of justice networks across the country, internationally as well, that represented different walks of life, different races, different professions, different genders, et cetera, um, but that also demonstrated deep statistical work. Um, some of the first protests of the NAACP that were against exactly uh, the violence on black bodies, lynchings that were happening at the turn of the century were exactly ones that were, I mean, you can look at the kind of map of protest posters and um, they're amazing. I mean, they cite a huge range of different statistics about the participation and the contributions of black labor to different sectors, to agriculture, to industry, to um, education, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, and then also of course, the number of black lives being lost over the decades um, without any action, without any action of the criminal justice system lost to lynchings. Um, and so again, you know, this sort of moment is um, bringing back again to sort of 
um, a, a long history of, of just an evidence of protest work and um, as research work. Um, so I've been really grateful for that. Which brings to mind Dan's point about the messiness of data and its interpretability, right? Dan, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in just really quickly. I um, I loved the way Anita's talk began um, because it's been so powerful seeing, seeing just again in real life how the research agenda is set on the streets and the kind of intellectual work that happens in protest. Uh, it's just invigorating. Um, I wanted to say one thing about the census, which is interesting, right? Uh, Melissa Nobles and her kind of periodization of the census makes clear the Throughout most of the 19th century, the census acts as a tool primarily for creating scientific racism, for justifying uh, racial hierarchies. Uh, from 1970 on, it becomes a tool uh, mobilized and used primarily by the civil rights uh, movement, the, the racial categories. So the same categories I change a little bit, but, and, but can be mobilized and used by different uh, groups for different purposes over, over time. And they, they have, it's interesting to see that flexibility and how much that political power and force can then shape them. Uh, I was at a rally on 168th Street uh, the other day and uh, heard a uh, Harlem pastor talking to some people behind me saying, yeah, we're out for Black Lives Matter and we're out organizing for the census because when you vote, if you don't count in the census, then your votes don't count. Uh, for your representatives. And uh, when we talk about defunding the police, it's so interesting, right? Because it's about pulling my funding out of the police, but then being able to read that, redirect that funding to health, education, and other social services. Uh, when you need those funds that would come in through, there are so, so many of those funds are directly uh, funneled via automated systems that are dependent on census data. But that said, I, I love also the, what Anita's showing, right? These ways in which we can imagine other kinds of data making. Uh, I talk about census sometimes as democracy data, and if you think of, uh, of the kind of democracy that we have, if this is its data, it's a kind of lame democracy. It could be much better. Uh, and I would love to think about the kind of work we can all do together, imagining what uh, what democracy's data should look like in a more equitable uh, democracy, one that doesn't center normative white heterosexual male lives, uh, and instead is much more like imaginatively creative. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on that phrase, lame democracy, and its, and its attendant data, is, and to ask each of you how you're thinking about bringing your work forward. So how, for each of your projects, are you thinking about the move, the necessary move between la from lame democracy to thick democracy, or thick data? I can jump in um, and, and try a, a quick response at this. Uh, and so a lot of it, I think, has to do with uh, kind of uh, gesturing towards and highlighting the amount of work that's happening, the kind of research work, intellectual labor that's happening, not in traditional academic spaces and scholarly spaces. So, you know, uh, bringing it uh, into the street and into the into publics and into spaces of community engagement um, that again are not the ivory tower. And I think that challenges a lot of academics, um, but also uh, hopefully is an exciting invitation because I think we've got so many allies and so um, much new energy that's coming from different kinds of research networks um, that uh, that are so demonstrative of, dem of dem data's democracy, democracy's data, or trying to reinvent new practices. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, you know, for, for, for me, it's a little bit of a continuation of what some of the work I've been up to in terms of collaborating with free software networks um, in Latin America um, and different open technology networks in Latin America had been about. But um, so this summer um, I'll be working uh, on putting together a workshop for the Allied Media Conference and hope to see many of us in, the, in our space. I know I'll see many of us in the data and society space and hopefully we'll also get to see many uh, and get to meet with some of the folks in our audience as well for that. So there'll be a femi feminist data justice um, panel that will be organizing um, those of a, a network of us who are part of a feminist data manifest no document um, that I encourage folks to, to look up um, as well as um, Lisa Nakamura and uh, his work from um, digital media studies program in uh, UMICH and also uh, um, Catherine D. Ignazio and Lauren Klein who are part of the feminist data 
um, and data feminism work um, that I think hopefully many in our audience are also familiar with. Uh, the, uh, the work of Unsettle and uh, collaborating, continuing um, collaborations with the Unsettle um, cluster that's also been seeded um, really terrifically uh, at Data and Society with Sarita Amrute and uh, Rigo Lara and, uh, and Sierra Dismore um, as behind the scenes, but also in front of the scenes as well, leading the energies. Um, and then lastly, doing some work. We've been doing a lot of work this summer. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in the past couple of years, but um, including over the summer um, with an effort that we've um, launched here at the U of I, at the I school, um, the founding of a community data clinic. And so we've been collaborating and um, launching some, fostering some growing research projects with um, some of the local um, civic organizations and community organizations that have been up to crisis response post COVID, um, but also um, in, in, in light of uh, attempts to really address and redress the work of um, not just police reform, um, but trying to reimagine what security could look like from a, um, a community standpoint. Thank you, that's absolutely brilliant. I really appreciate those answers. I'm going to turn to some of our lovely questions from the Q&A. They're really very generative. I'll try to bunch a few together. The first set of questions is for Michelle and it revolves around the question of protection. So folks on the chat are asking what measures could be taken to further data protection for marginalized communities and also for those who are protesting um, what are the possibilities or resources that you could recommend who, to those who wish to demonstrate but might be concerned about their data collection associated with exercising their constitutionally protected rights in 2020? Sure. So in terms of keeping your data secure when you're protesting, that is an important question. There are some very good guides online that provide more detailed technical instructions than I can do here that would help people um, protect particularly all the information on their smartphones if they're out at protests and keep that information out of the hands of police if, if those interactions happen. So there are some good quality guides online and I would direct people towards those. In terms of what can we do for legal reform, one thing that's been very exciting about my fellowship and a real honor has been able, I've been able to talk to advocates and activists all over the country who also do legal services work. And as legal services lawyers, we are people who help our clients gain access to basic needs of life, housing, food, medical care, education. Um, and we are seeing, as I spoke earlier, about all the ways that technology can impact our clients. And they're starting um, to be very exciting activism about these issues. So in some jurisdictions, um, cities have outlawed facial recognition technology, um, but that shouldn't be a city by city um, determination. We should have a national law in that regard. Um, there are other scattered laws that protect people's biometric information that provide certain workplace protections, but they're very, I would say, scattered and isolated. So what we really need is advocacy on a national level and a national commitment to both recognizing people's individual privacy rights, but also our interests collectively in securing privacy for, for all of us. Thank you. Then we have some questions about how to read data and what happens when you read data. Um, and the question is when, say, we read a nerdy and seemingly revelatory Atlantic story larded with data and statistics, particularly demographic data, what should we be thinking about? How does, Anita, your approach to relational infrastructures and Dan, your approach to data, wave particle duality, how does that help inform our daily reading practices of our data saturated public culture? I'll, I'll do it briefly. I know I want to really hear uh, Anita's response, but um, it, like on, on Twitter, my thing is that I study things shrouded by cloaks of boringness. And so one of my, one of my problems with data often is that um, the sheen of objectivity or its numerical charisma makes it difficult to engage with it or to feel like one can engage with it with the kind of uh, interpretive frames uh, 
or the kind of um, intelligence that one deals with other forms of rhetoric. Uh, and so like at one level, when you're reading the Atlantic article, right, you don't know where any of these numbers are coming from in, in many cases. So you treat them the same way you treat most of the other facts in the Atlantic article. Um, but but the, the key thing I want for many readers or many folks is to think like, all right, well, I can engage with this data and these categories the same way I would engage with everything else in this, that data should be not understood as a separate category, but a one part of culture. And when we read it, then it becomes important to read it with the same kinds of critical lenses that we apply to all other parts of culture as well. I think that's the other important thing that reading data then forces us and invites us to think about race, class, gender, sexuality, and all the other kinds of ways in which we understand it. I mean, that in the very basic level, when you read that, you should probably think, when you see demographic data, you should think like, oh, demographic data is always, especially like when you're talking any, I mean, probably now too, um, it always is about placing people in boxes that they often have no choice whatsoever whether they get placed in those boxes in the first place. And then whenever you see anything that looks like a very precise number, you should assume that there's a very large error bar. Yeah, I want to echo Dan's lo lo beautiful response uh, and just to say that, you know, when you see this kind of gorgeous, beautiful compilation of statistics and data sets, you have to sort of like, you know, pause and really push yourself outside or beyond this kind of um, the um, the uh, instinct that we have to just sort of believe and trust in the numbers. It's like, it's so natural when you see something that large and that impressively compiled and it's beautifully formatted and be, it's all cleaned up and all the categories are so stable. Look at those columns and those lines and those roles. They're so gorgeous. And then sometimes they're coming from these super authoritative spaces, right? Or places like a Facebook or Amazon that will say, these are terabytes and, terabytes and terabytes of information, it's all compiled, gorgeous. How could it not be objective? Uh, and to really step outside of that kind of notion of like just rote belief or trust in that kind of sense and argument of, of objectivity and push back and just remind yourselves that these were created by real humans, sometimes not real, human, real humans in institutions that don't look like the rest of the world and who are embedded in not just relationships, but l deeply political and culturally shaped spaces and places with economic interests with all kinds of, right, sort of different kinds of interests circula circulating around them. And so then when you see, you know, a compilation, again, petabytes and petabytes of uh, facial of uh, facial recognition data uh, and all coming forth from, you know, a Facebook or Amazon or micro Microsoft um, saying that this is an objective compilation of different kinds of spaces and uh, faces and parameters and forms of recognition of, of faces now digitized, right? To be able to say, is it really? And is, is it, has it not been also comp compiled by, I mean, again, gesturing towards some of the uh, past questions that African-American data sci scientists and researchers all provoked us brought us to, to, to ask, which was, are those facial recognition data sets actually ones that are fully representative? And if it, given that they are, we know that they're not, um, can we take a look at, again, the backdrop of the cultural context um, that produced this, the, the uh, policies and relationships behind the data set um, to really shine a spotlight on that as opposed to just paying attention, keeping your gaze fixed on the numbers, as opposed to, again, drawing back the lens and seeing the kind of um, cultural politics and the bodies that were really behind its making with real interest and in politics in mind. If I could say just one more thing to add on to Anita too, then there's, although the question was about like the reader of the Atlantic article, the writer of the Atlantic article, or particularly the, anyone whose job involves dealing with a lot of data, I feel like that's where there's a really big change because there's a real responsibility for people who deal with data sets to understand where their data sets come from and to see them not as, to see them as one part of that wave particle duality, like one result. And they really need to understand the whole thing to know what the data really is. Um, one, I'm gonna make a shout out to an article called Digital Natives by Joanna Radin, which is a wonderful example of what it is to take one data set and really try to do a trace of its history and how that shows the, like what you really need to know about it. Thank you. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have time for. There was a quick question in the Q&A. Dan, what is your background? And maybe for Michelle and Anita, what's a book on your lovely shelf that uh, you're reading right now? Because these books aren't real. Uh, this is from 1930, uh, and it's, um, it's from the United States Census Bureau in 1930 for an advertisement, and it is great. Uh, okay. Uh, reading Data Feminism by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein, who Anita had earlier referenced. Great book. 
Uh, I'm reading a, a bunch of uh, historical texts on uh, on W. Du Bois' um, Atlanta School of Sociology, um, the first uh, American school of sociology, um, fully invisibilized by lots of sociological um, grandstanders much later, um, but really recognized, and even the ASA is now coming back to recognizing the real place of Du Bois's Atlanta School of Sociology that had been completely divisibilized. So the work of Alton Morris, um, Segregated Scholars is another text. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll share the, the text uh, resources with uh, CJ to pass them on. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Michelle Gilman, Anita Sechan, and Dan Boak for your wonderful talks tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at future programming and we welcome your feedback. Thank you and take care. <laughs>